Hey, do you understand who Jesus is and what he came to do? Was he simply a good man, a good teacher, a good moral example? Or was he and is he God in the flesh who died on the cross and rose again to save sinners? Join me today to learn the truth about Jesus of Nazareth. have your Bible, please turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. As you all know, Queen Elizabeth II passed away in September of 2022. She was 96 years old and she reigned on the throne of England for 50 years. Upon her death, her royal bodyguard, whose name was Dick Griffin, shared a story that was very amusing. He said that uh, in the summer times, Queen Elizabeth would go to uh, their, their summer home in Scotland uh, called Balmoral, just her little getaway summer home. We have a picture of the little getaway summer home. There it is. <laughs> and... Uh, so he said that he was with her there, and she, uh, she would like to go out for picnics for lunch. And so they went on a picnic for lunch, and then just she and the queen were walking uh, some of the trails there. And they ran across two American hikers that were on vacation, and, and they struck up a conversation. They didn't recognize who she was. And so they just struck up a conversation. They said, yeah, we're here, you know, from America, and we're visiting Great Britain and all the different things. And, and then they asked her, they said, now, do you, do you live here? And she goes, no, I live in London, but my family has a, a holiday house here. And uh, that, that giant mansion, you know, <laughs> she didn't tell them that. And uh, just uh, on the other side of the hills. And they said, oh, well, how long have you been coming up here to these Scottish hills? And she said, Oh, since I was a little girl, over 80 years. And they said, well, you must have met the queen. <laughs> and she said, no, I haven't, but Dick meets with her regularly. <laughs> and they said to the bodyguard, Dick Griffin, they said, you, you, you meet with the queen? Yes. They said, what is the queen like? He said, well, she can be quite cantankerous. But she has a lovely sense of humor. And Dick said before he could realize what they were doing, they handed their camera to Queen Elizabeth, put their arm around Dick, and said, can you take a picture of us? And she did. And then he said, well, let me take a picture of you all together. And they took a picture with the queen, not knowing it was the queen. And then they left, and Queen Elizabeth said, I can't wait. I'd love to be on a fly on, a fly on the wall when they show that picture to some of their friends in America and they say, that is the queen. <laughs> they were in the presence of royalty and they didn't even know it. Well, last week we started a brand new series. It's called The Truth About the truth about dot, 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 because we're just going to fill in what we're going to talk about. And we shared the truth in an opening message, the truth about the Bible, how we can have confidence, total confidence that the Bible truly is the word of the living God. It is God breathed and inspired by God. It has the breath of God, the life of God on it, and we can trust the word of God Jesus said in John 17, 17, his great high priestly prayer, said to the Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And so we get everything about God from the word of God. The truth of God is found in the word of God. And today we want to talk about the truth about Jesus of Nazareth. Now, did you know that lots of people come to church and uh, they, they think they know about Jesus of Nazareth, but, but it's, it's fuzzy, it's hazy. 
Uh, you know, we have people that come, every church, their biggest crowds, Easter and, Christ, uh, Easter and Christmas. Those are the biggest crowds. Now, we know Christmas time is when we celebrate the coming of the Lord, his incarnation where Jesus puts on flesh and he's born of a virgin and he's born in Bethlehem. We celebrate that. Easter time, we celebrate uh, the cross, Good Friday, and the resurrection, uh, Victory Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And people will come and they'll know a little bit about it, but they don't really understand what that means. I remember years ago when I was at Champion Forest, it was Easter Sunday, and I was talking to this guy uh, before one of the services, and I found out he was Jewish, and it was Easter Sunday. And I said, well, you're a Christian? No, I'm a Jew. I said, well, that's great. And I said, can you help me out here? I, why are you here? You know, we're, we're celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And you don't believe Jesus is the Christ who rose from the dead. He said, no, but, but I like the music. I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm glad you're here. That guy ended up getting saved. But he was coming uh, because his wife invited him, and he just said, well, this is fun. I, I like the music. But he didn't really understand the message, the truth about Jesus of Nazareth. Now, what did the people say about Jesus? What did the religious leaders, what was, uh, what was it they said about Jesus? Well, he has a demon and is insane. That's what they said about Jesus. They saw Jesus uh, perform all the miracles, and they said, well, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. That was their summation of how he did what he did. And they called the head of the household, Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. They missed it by a million miles. They were in the presence of the Lord, their long-awaited Messiah, and they said, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Hey, do you understand who Jesus is and what he came to do? Mark chapter 1, this Passage, beginning in verse 21, sets off the Galilean ministry of Jesus. His headquarters was in Capernaum, and it says, They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. That was kind of his custom when he'd go to a new place. They were amazed, it says, at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes always taught in footnotes. They would say, well, Rabbi Hillel says this, and Rabbi Gamaliel says that, and Rabbi Shammai says this. Well, Jesus didn't quote anybody. He spoke as having authority, and they were amazed. They, that literally means to, to strike a blow. It's like the, he just blew their minds. Wow, we've never heard teaching like this before. And then it says, verse 23, just then there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out saying, what business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. He didn't need for demons to be on his publicity team. Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing the man into convulsions, and the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed so that they debated among themselves. There was a buzz in the crowd saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him immediately. That's one of John or Mark's favorite words. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. Hey, the demons who were in this man... Because they, they were plural, what do we have to do with you? The demons that were in the, that man, they knew who Jesus was. They call him Jesus of Nazareth, which was a, a designation they used for Jesus. It's used 16 times in the New Testament. Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus the Nazarene. That's connecting him to a real place. Jesus didn't fall out of the sky. Jesus was born of a virgin miraculous conce uh, conception, but he was born of a virgin, and uh, he, he born in Bethlehem, lived in Nazareth, and they connected him to Nazareth. We know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. 
So four truths that I want to share with you today concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Now, these are basic truths, but they're truths that are under fire today as we start to drift away from the truth and drift away from the way it used to be 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, what people believed concerning the Word of God and the Son of God. And so some of these things you say, yeah, well, everybody knows that. But everybody doesn't know this. And the reason it's so important, they're critical truths. Why? Because eternity hangs in the balance. If you miss these truths, you're going to miss heaven. And I don't want anyone to miss heaven. Truth number one, Jesus is a real person. He's a real person. He really did live in the first century. He was probably born not at, he wasn't born in the year one, but he was born Uh, before Herod died. Herod died in 4 B.C., and so he was probably born in uh, in late 5 B.C. He was a real person. C.S. Lewis, he had uh, uh, an apologetic that he used with people, and it, it all started with L. He said, now Jesus is either one of three persons. He's either a liar who said he was the son of God and knew he wasn't. He was just lying about it. Or number two, he was a lunatic who thought he was the son of God and wasn't. Or he was Lord. He was the son of God. Liar, lunatic, or Lord. He said you can't have it any other way. He can't be a good moral teacher and claim to be the son of God at the same time because those things don't wash. Well, people have taken that uh, liar, lunatic, Lord, and they've added another L to it. And they say, Jesus is a legend. He didn't really exist. He's like Bigfoot, you know, and not real. And he's just a legend. Well, he's a real person. He really lived. He was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth. He has a birthplace. He has a hometown, a growing up town. And uh, growing up in Nazareth, I mean, they, they... they really downplayed that. Anytime they, you run across where they call him Jesus of Nazareth, it's kind of a slam because Nazareth is like, a, you know, that's just a crummy part of town. It's just like, who in Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel said that when they, we have found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of what? Of Nazareth. I mean, that would be like hearing we found the, the Messiah, Jesus of Genoa. Jesus of Genoa, come on. No offense to Genoa, uh, but, you know, it's just not the place where you think, well, Messiah is going to come from there. It, you don't think that, right? And so they, they didn't think that. It, Nazareth was a grease spot on the road. It was just a nothing place. And so anytime they said that, that was to discount and discredit him. But he was known as Jesus of Nazareth. Well, that's a real place, and so he's really connected to uh, history. And the Bible makes it clear that Jesus really did live. And you say, well, yeah, but what do you do with the person that doesn't believe the Bible? You try and tell them from the Bible that Jesus really did live. They throw out the Bible. Now, remember what we said about the Bible last week. The Bible is not one book. It's a collection of 66 books. And so when you throw out the New Testament, you have eight writers in the New Testament who all attest to the same thing. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those are four different documents. It's not that they wrote them together. Four different books. You know, you have uh, 66 books in all of the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Eight writers make up those 27 books. And so Peter and Paul and uh, James and Jude, they all attest to the fact that Jesus Christ was a real person. You say, well, I don't believe the Bible. Okay, well, let's go outside of the Bible. What do people say outside of the Bible? Well, Jesus was attested by secular historians. They talk about Jesus, and there are three who lived in the first century. There's Josephus, Flavius Josephus, Jewish historian. He acknowledges Jesus in his writings, The Antiquities of the Jews. He lived AD 37 to 100. We have Tacitus, who is a Roman historian. He acknowledges uh, Jesus. Well, he lived in the first century, 56 to 120 A.D., and Pliny the Younger. Can you imagine that being your name? Hi, I'm Jeff. What's your name? I'm Pliny the Younger. Okay. All right. Well, you you don't look so young. Anyway, um, 
he was a Roman historian, 62 to 111 A.D. They all speak of Jesus. So when you have the, the eight witnesses who are included in the Bible, and then the other guys, ancient writers, that they say, yeah, he's a real person. Obviously, Jesus existed. Second truth. So we establish he's a real person. Secondly, Jesus is both God and man. Now that is, you go from being a real person to all of a sudden you're the only begotten son of God. You're God and man. That is a, a big claim. Jesus was one person with two natures. Every cult, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, every cult you'll run into, this is where they're going to fall and fail at the person of Christ. They don't want to say because they're, they're energized by the enemy who's deceiving them. And they all say, well, Jesus is something less than God. He is God, but he's not co-equal with God the Father. I remember talking to a Mormon one time, and I, I said, uh, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Yes, we believe that. You believe Jesus is God? Yes. I said, do you believe Jesus is co-equal with God the Father? Well, No. I don't believe that. He's, he's not that. Jesus is a God like you can become a God. Anybody that tells you that, you need to run. Okay? That person is not talking about the Jesus of the Bible. We get truth from the Bible, from what they wrote, from the word of the living God. And what does the word of the living God say about Jesus? He is both God and man. Now, the passage in Philippians 2, explains it this way. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, a thing to be held onto, but he emptied himself. He laid aside those things that were innately his, his privileges as God. He didn't cease to be God, but he'd emptied himself of those privileges of God, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Taking the form of a doulos, that's the lowest slave, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man. He's a man, and he's God. What does the demon say about Jesus? What business do we have to do with each other? Jesus of Nazareth, you're a man. We know who you are, the Holy One of God. You're a man, but you're also God. You are both. And Jesus is the God-man. Jesus is the creator who took on human flesh. That's who he is. Uh, when you read in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, we naturally think of God the Father. But the Bible says in John chapter 1, a very similar sounding introduction to John's gospel in the beginning was the Word, he says. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. He's creator God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, and he is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That means he's, he's primary. He's over all the creation of God. Doesn't mean he's created. He's the firstborn, primary over everything that was created. For by him, all things were made, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Not only is Jesus the creator, he's the one who holds it all together. Jesus is God in the flesh. The creator put on human flesh. Now, we call that the incarnation. People sometimes get kind of stumped by that incarnation. I don't know if I can ever remember what that means, incarnation. Well, you know when you eat chili con carne, that means chili with meat. The incarnation means that God put on meat. He put on flesh. That God became 
a man, and he did it without denying his deity or distorting his humanity. It says in Colossians 2 verse 9, for in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Jesus is the creator who became a man. Never anybody else like him. You know, we talk about, well, like the Mormons. Well, you, we can become a son of God just like Jesus was the son of God. Jesus is the only begotten son of God. There's only one Jesus. We, we follow him in being sons and daughters of God when we come to know him by faith. But there's only one there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He is God and he is man. He's not two persons. He's one person with two natures. The nature of God because he's God. The nature of man because he is man. Now you have people that will say concerning Jesus and, and the deity of Jesus. They say, well, wait a minute. I believe that Jesus is the son of God, but I don't believe Jesus is God. You know, Jesus never claimed to be God. Have you ever heard somebody say that? He never claimed to be God. Hmm. Is that true? He never claimed to be God? Of course that's not true. He claimed to be God. He received worship. The wise men worshipped him when he was just uh, there in his infancy. Uh, they worshipped him after he, Peter walked on the water and then began to sink. And the Lord brought him back into the boat. And they got back into the boat. And they worshipped him and said, of a truth, you are the Son of God. The man in John chapter 9 that was born blind, Jesus healed him, and that man worshipped him. Who, who receives worship? Only God. Jesus Christ is God. And in John chapter 5, this is what the Scripture said. You know, he did a, a miracle on the Sabbath, which was horrors. You don't do that. And so it says in John chapter 5, verse 18, For this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath... But he was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. When you call God your father, when you say you're the son of God, in the minds of the Jews, immediately that says you're saying you're God. Now, we can say, we try and separate that out. No, he never says he's God, he says he's the son of God. They knew exactly what he meant when he said he was the son of God. And Jesus, that wasn't his favorite designation for himself. Jesus' favorite designation for himself was the son of man. The son of man. I looked it up. The son of man is used 84 times in the New Testament, in the gospel accounts, every single time by Jesus. Every single time, 84 times, son of man. The only one that uses it one time in the book of Acts is Stephen as he's getting stoned, and he says, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Jesus is the one that referred to himself as the Son of Man. Now, why is that? Well, I think because from eternity past, he's been the Son of God. And for 33 years, he was the Son of Man. I think it was kind of new and fresh to be the Son of Man, but... I didn't find any other theologians that joined me in that. So we take that for, with a grain of salt. 25 times in the Gospels, he's called the Son of God. And the Jews uh, use that a lot. Are you the Son of God? You know, remember Peter in his declaration, uh, who do people say that I am, Jesus asked. And they say, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Jeremiah, some say one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are Messiah, Son of the living God. God. Jesus claimed to be God. John chapter 8. Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to meet, see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And he said, how have you seen Abraham? You're not yet 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? He said, before Abraham was born, I am. And they freaked out because I am is the name of God. That's the holy name of God. I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. And what did they do in response to that? They picked up stones to stone him. What is the penalty for blasphemy in the Mosaic law? Stoning. We stone you to death for blasphemy. You claim to be God. You take the place of God. John chapter 10. 
And when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, well, they picked up stones again to stone him. He said, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? And they said, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, claim to be God. He said he was the Son of God, which is saying you are God. Do you remember at his trial? Uh, the, the witnesses came forth, and they kept contradicting one another. And finally, the high priest, he was just so frustrated, he said, tell us plainly, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One, the Son of God? And Jesus said, yes, I am. And the high priest tore his robes and said, blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard it yourself. What do you say? And they said, he is deserving of death. Why? Because he claimed to be the son of God. Don't ever let somebody tell you Jesus never claimed to be God. Yes, he did. And that's why they crucified him. When Pilate was trying to let him go in John chapter 19, and he said, I found, you know, he, he punished him. He was going to release him. And they said, you can't release him. He said, well, you take him yourself and judge him according to your law. And they said, we have a law. And by that law, he deserves to die because he said he is the son of God. And that made Pilate very afraid because Pilate knew there was something different about this man. Jesus made it clear that he was God. God in the flesh, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. You know what's interesting? Matthew chapter 22. You know, the, the religious leaders all the time trying to trick Jesus, all the time trying to trap Jesus, ask him all these questions. Remember they asked him, Matthew 22, about the resurrection and the guy that had the wife and then he died and then his brother married her and then the other and the seven brothers, they all die. Who, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Ha, ha, ha. Because they didn't believe in the resurrection. They were Sadducees that were asking the question. And Jesus said, you are mistaken not understanding the scriptures or the power of God. So he shut down their question and showed them how ridiculous it was. But then he asked them a question. And he said, the Christ, whose son is he? I said, well, that's, a, that's easy. He's the son of David. I said, oh, son of David. He said then, how does David in the spirit call him Lord when he says in one, Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool under your feet. He said, if David calls him Lord, how then is he his son? And it got deathly quiet. No one was able to answer that question, nor did they ask him any other questions after that. What's the answer to that question? How can the Christ be David's son and David's Lord because he's the God-man. That's how. He is God in the flesh. Now, for the Jews, cutting them a little bit of slack, they didn't have an understanding of that. That was, that was huge for the gospel writers to write that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It was huge for John to write, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that he is God in the flesh, because they were never taught that. They were never taught that Messiah was going to be God in the flesh. Messiah was going to be a political leader, a ruler, and he was going to turn the tables on the Gentiles. That's what they learned about the Messiah. They didn't know that Messiah was going to be God in the flesh. But that's who Jesus is, both God and man. That is why the cults, they're always going to twist it on the deity of Christ. And you know that that's another Jesus whom we have not preached. If the Jesus that you're hearing about is not the God of creation... If he's not co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father, he's not the, God, he's not the Jesus of the Bible. You believed in another Jesus whom we have not preached. The Jesus of Islam is not the Jesus of the Bible. There is one Jesus, and there's only one Jesus who can save, and that is the Jesus of the Bible. So Jesus is a real person. He's both God and man. Thirdly, he came to earth for a rescue mission. That was his purpose coming to earth. A rescue mission. He came to seek and to save that which was 
lost. It says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, since then the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. He became flesh and blood, that through death, He might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. The Son of Man appeared for this purpose, 1 John 3, 8, that he might destroy the works of the devil. He came on a rescue mission. Now, when you follow some of the polls and some of the things that... uh, Pew Research or the Barna Research Group or uh, Billy Graham's group, the Decision Magazine, they do these surveys to find out where people are, where Christians are in their understanding of things. Did you know that among those who claim to be born-again Christians, less than 50% of these surveyed by Decision Magazine believe that Jesus Christ was sinless? And I say, well, you know, I mean, he, he's, he's a man, We believe he's the son of God, but was he sinless? No, no, probably not sinless because there's a lot of sin around. So I don't think Jesus was sinless. Well, you don't understand what the scripture says. You don't understand why it was so important. He had to be born of a virgin. Why? So that he would not have a sin nature so that he could be sinless. He had to live a sinless, spotless life. That is required for him to be our Passover lamb, for him to be our savior. 1 Peter chapter 1, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, unblemished, spotless lamb. You know, when they chose the Passover lamb, you couldn't just get any, well, that lamb will do that, that, he's got three legs, let's get rid of him. You can't choose that one. It's got to be a perfect lamb, an unblemished, spotless lamb. If the Lord Jesus had sin, he couldn't be our Savior. So he's a sinless, spotless Savior. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, that he committed no sin, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He never spoke a lie, and he committed no sin. And he had to do that in order to be our sacrifice. So he had to live a sinless, spotless life, and he had to die on the cross and rise from the dead. You know, when I was in evangelism explosion years ago and and learned that uh, curriculum of how to share your faith, one of the things we talked about is the uh, obviously when you're sharing your faith, they have to talk about the person of Christ and the work of Christ. And we said that, uh, you know, when you think of Jesus, you think of miracles because Jesus healed the sick, he raised the dead, he calmed the storm, he cleansed the leper, he did all these things, he fed the multitudes, did all these miracles. But the miracles were all to point to who he was and what he came to do. He did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And how was he going to do that? Through the cross and the empty tomb. And he would tell his disciples, "Listen, it's getting closer. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of sinners, and they're going to uh, brutalize him. They're going to nail him to a tree, and then he's going to rise three days later." They didn't understand what that meant. Because to them, it's like, that can't happen. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. That's not what we've read in the Old Testament. That's not what happens to the Messiah. The Messiah rules and reigns. He's, he's the son of David. See, there are two comings in the Old Testament. There's the first coming of the suffering servant, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. And then there's the second coming when he rules and reigns. That's what we're waiting for. They missed his first coming because they got it convoluted with his second coming. But in his first coming, all the miracles were just to point that he was the Messiah. And then he came for the specific purpose of dying on the cross and rising again from the dead. In Luke chapter 24, the first day of the week, you know, he's crucified on Friday And then on Sunday morning, they come to anoint the body. They can't do anything on Saturday. Their Sabbath, it started at 6 p.m. on Friday night, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. to Saturday night. And then at night, you weren't going to do anything. So they came early in Sunday morning, and they come to the tomb. And the tomb, the stone is rolled away, and they look in. There's no Jesus. And they see two men 
in dazzling apparel. They were angels, and they recognized them as being angelic beings. They bowed low, the women. And the angel said, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee saying, now watch this, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. That was a must. And Jesus said to the men on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas and the other guy that's unnamed, oh foolish men and slow in heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and afterward to enter into his glory? It was necessary. He must do that. There is no salvation without his suffering. There is no salvation without his death and burial and resurrection. That's the work. He came on a rescue mission. Now, I, I might have told you about my aunt. We were talking one day. She was married to my uncle, Uncle Harry, whom, whom I loved, and he was Jewish. And I remember asking her, I'd just been a Christian for a short while, and uh, she was Catholic, and I said to her, I said, Regina, what about Harry? I mean, this is, this is a concern, great concern. And she said, well, Jeff, I, your, Harry, your Uncle Harry's a good man. I just think heaven's a place for all good people. I said, well, where in the world do you get that? You don't get that from the Bible. You just get that from your own. You just made it up. You just want it to be that. Truth is not what you think. It's not what you feel. It's not what you want it to be. It's what God says. That's truth. That's reality. And you have to find it in the Word. Well, you're not going to find in the Word that heaven's a place for all good people. Why in the world did God send His Son if all you have to do is be good? Well, just be good and you'll get to heaven because heaven's a place for all good people. No. The Son of Man must be delivered up. He must be crucified. He must rise again on the third day. That is the rescue mission of the Lord who is God in the flesh. Now, the demons that Jesus spoke to that day in Capernaum, what business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. What business do we have with you? Are you, are you going to cast us into hell? Are you going to destroy us in hell? That demon and the demons in general, they knew. They knew who he was. They knew what he came to do. The devil is not an atheist. Do you believe, James chapter 1, do you believe God, or James chapter 2, verse 19, do you believe in one God? Well, whoop de doo The demons also believe and tremble. I added the whoop de doo It doesn't really say that in the Greek. <laughs> but the demons also believe and tremble. They know that Jesus is real. They know that he is God in the flesh. They know he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. They know it all here. They don't know it here. It's not real in their hearts. And so the fourth truth, Jesus will save anyone who repents and believes. Just to know who he is, to know he's real, to know he died on the cross and rose again from the dead, that is not enough. Then you have to do something with it. You have to respond to that news. There must be a response. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. It is a trustworthy statement. Deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom, Paul says, I am foremost of all, I am chief. Now, how does a person get saved? First of all, so important, you must have an awareness of your desperate situation. You cannot get saved unless you have an awareness that you are in trouble. If you're not in Christ, you are in trouble, in serious trouble. Jesus, what do we have to do with you? Have you come to torment us before the time, as it says in another passage when D Jesus dealt with a, uh, with a demon-possessed person? Have you come to destroy us? We are, they're afraid of Jesus. There has to be a fear. You have to see yourself as you are, a sinner before a holy God that produces fear. That's why the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 
And it, without a fear of the Lord, you're never going to get saved. Because the fear of the Lord recognizes that God is God. He is holy God. And I am sinful man. And I have no business before a holy God. As Peter in Luke chapter 5, when they had the miracle of the, uh, of the catch. Throw out your nets in the deep water for a catch. And Peter said, Lord, we've been fishing all night and caught nothing. But at your word, at your bidding, I'll do it. And they threw out the nets. And they caught so many fish that the boats began to sink. And Peter was just amazed and he was arrested by the fact that he's in the presence of holy God. And he says, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. There has to be that realization, that understanding. He is holy. We know who you are, the holy one of God. He is holy and I am sinful. And I am in trouble, and I'm in desperate need. Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the body and the soul in hell. That's who you need to fear. We have people today, there's no fear of God. And, and they, oh, sure, I'll believe in Jesus. They come to church, and it's just fun, and they love the music, and oh, it's just great, and you want to trust Jesus? Well, sure, that'd be super. I'll do that. There's no awareness of their sinfulness. And so you know what? When there's no awareness of your sinfulness and the fact that God is holy, 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 and if Jesus isn't your Savior, he's going to be your judge, if you don't have any awareness of that, you know what you don't do? You don't repent. And Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You can't just believe on Jesus without turning from sin. If you don't repent, you will perish. You can't trust Jesus while holding on to sin. He hates sin. He died on the cross for sin. God hates sin. So you have to recognize I'm a sinner, and you turn from sin, and you turn to the Savior. So you have awareness an awareness of your desperate situation. That's why parents with, with young children, you know, if they say they want, to, they want to pray to receive Christ, you don't want to pour cold water on that, but you want to make sure they understand what it means to be a sinner. I became a Christian as a 17-year-old high school senior, and the reason I became a Christian and the way I became a Christian is God convicted my heart that I was a sinner and I was lost, and if I died, I'd go to hell, and rightfully so. And it was that understanding that caused me to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Because he has grace that's greater than all our sin. So you have an awareness of your desperate situation, and then you trust Jesus and Jesus alone for your salvation. That's the right response to Jesus when you understand who he is. Now, you don't trust Jesus plus your good works. That's where a lot of people get fouled up. They say, well, you know, I, I just think it's a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of my effort. Well, if you think it's a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of your works, then you're 100% lost. It has nothing to do with your works. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. It's grace alone, faith alone, in God's grace alone, in Christ alone, that's what saves. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. It's Jesus, not Jesus plus, but Jesus only. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation, and we sing that song, in my hands no price I bring, but simply to your cross I cling. When we come that way, as we sang just a little bit ago, I plead the blood that's my only hope. This is all my hope and plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm not trusting in anything I'm doing. I'm trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone. First John chapter one, or John chapter one, he was in the world, speaking of Jesus, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, recognized who he was. Real person, the God-man who died on the cross and rose again. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood. That means it's not through the bloodline. It's not just because mom and dad are Christians, just because grandpa was a Christian. That doesn't do anything for you. It's not through generations who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh 
That means you can't grit your teeth and say, I'm going to become a Christian. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do this thing. Can't do it that way. Nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. That means that as much as I want you to become a Christian, I can't become, I can't will that for you. You sin is personal and so is salvation. You have to make that decision for yourself. Who are born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. You have to be born again, born from above. And when you receive Jesus, he changes your life. Now, isn't it interesting in the passage we read in Mark? that the people were amazed. They were astonished at Jesus, the way he taught, the way he had authority over demons. The demons were afraid of him, and the people were amazed. Listen, the fear has to lead to surrender. The fear has to lead to surrender. And until you surrender to Jesus, it's just going to be all in your head. It's not going to change your heart and life. I want to close with this story. Years ago, I read this, and a book by Jim Cimbala, and it popped into my mind this week. Cimbala was preaching at Easter time at Brooklyn Tabernacle. He said we'd had, at that time, he said we had three services. This is years and years ago. He said we had three services, and it was the third service, and I had preached three times, and, and we had put on three big uh, Easter services, and it was in the afternoon. He said, I was tired. And he said, all I wanted to do was, was go home. And he said, it was the last service, and people were at the altar praying. And he said, I was just sitting uh, there at the altar thinking, you know, I'm done. I just get to go home. And he said, all of a sudden, I looked up, and there was a guy about uh, four rows back looking at me. He said he was just, he had his hat in his hand, but his hat was as filthy as he'd ever seen. And this man just looked horrible, just so disheveled, hair all matted. And so he said he could tell the guy wanted to talk to him. And he said, you know, we had people come into the church all the time asking for money because of where their church was located, street people just everywhere wanting money. And so he said we had protocols for that because we didn't want to help them continue to get drugs and alcohol with with gifts. And so he said this guy looked at me and uh, Symbol is thinking, man, it's the end of Easter. This was a great day. I I, I don't want to have to deal with that guy. I know what he wants. He wants money. And he said, okay, well, I got to do something. So he motioned for the guy to come over. He said he came from the fifth row and he stood in front of Cymbala. And Cymbala said as he came forward, the smell that came off of that guy, the stench. He said it was a combination of feces, urine, sweat, street, just baking, he said, just put it in a pot and bake it in the sun. That's what that guy smelled like. He said it was the worst smell I'd ever smelled. He said, I was like, whoa. And he said, just to talk to him, he had to turn his head to get a breath so he could talk to the guy because it was just a nauseating smell. And he said, ask him some questions. He goes, uh, you know, where'd you sleep last night? He said, I slept in my truck. Or slept in, a, in an abandoned truck. He said, well, why didn't you go to a shelter? He said, well, The last shelter I went to, I almost got killed. It's not safe there. So Cymbala just was exchanging some, you know, some pastoral pleasantries. And then he reached into his pocket to get his his billfold to give the guy five bucks. He thought, I'll just give him some money. And, And he said he pulled out some money, he handed it to the guy, and the guy pushed it down. And he said, preacher, I don't want your money. He said, I want that Jesus that you were talking about. He said, I'm going to die on the streets. I need Jesus. And Cymbala was so convicted. And he began to weep before the Lord. He said, oh, God, forgive me. He said, you brought a guy right to me at Easter. And I tried to just give him some money so he would go away because he smells so bad. God, forgive me. And he said, the Lord spoke to us hard and said, Jim, he said, unless you embrace that smell, I'll never be able to use you. He said, that's what the whole world smells like to me because of sin. And he said, you have to embrace that smell so that I can use you to reach people for Christ. And he said, Cymbala began to weep and and his heart just broke. And he said, that guy David could tell. And, And he came in and put his head on Cymbala's chest, and Cymbala just hugged him. And Cymbala said, that 
horrible smell suddenly became the most beautiful smell I had ever smelled. God just transformed that, and he said, that's what the Savior came to do. Embrace guys like David. Embrace guys like you and me in our sin, a grace that is greater than all our sin. And that man was led to Christ by Jim Cimbala, and they cleaned him up. And they got him off drugs, and they hired him at the church. And his, his life was totally changed. Why? Because he saw his need. He saw he was in a desperate situation. He saw that he was a sinner before God, and he was going to, to go to hell as a helpless, hopeless sinner. And the only hope was in Jesus, who is a real person, who is God in the flesh, who died on the cross and rose again from the dead, the God who will save anybody who puts his faith and trust in Jesus of Nazareth. Thanks so much for watching. Listen, if you have not yet made a decision for Jesus Christ to receive him as Lord and Savior, today is the day for you. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And I ask you to forgive me and to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. Hey, I'd love to hear from you. Please contact me so we can help you and pray for you. You are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Thank you.